everyone, it's James from the Fit RV, and we are here today at Nations Starter and Alternator in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Now, as you may have already guessed, by the fact that I'm in an alternator shop, we are here for some upgrades. We're going to be doing two things today. First thing is we're going to be getting a larger alternator. Now, that's always going to be a good thing. And then the second thing, and probably the more nuanced, is that we're switching over to CAN-based charge control. Now, that one requires a little bit more explaining, so I think in order to do that, I'm going to take you over to Explainy James back in the shop, so take it away. Thanks. Okay, so there are two upgrades we're going to be tackling with Nations, and I'm going to start by explaining the easier one first. That's the alternator upgrade. So let's take this all the way back to square one for those of you who may not have tuned in before. Our RV is a Winnebago Echo. It comes from Winnebago with either one 320 amp hour lithium battery and a 2800 watt generator, or with two 320 amp hour lithium batteries. And those batteries are made by Lithionics. And in either of those cases, it also comes with a second alternator, which is dedicated to charging those lithium batteries. That alternator is made by Balmar and it's rated at a max output of 170 amps. So now that's a stock echo, but ours is significantly different from stock. We have no generator and we have not two, but five 320 amp hour lithium batteries. That's 1600 amp hours of battery capacity in old money or 20,480 watt hours if we want to refer to it properly. Now that's a lot of battery. If we wanted to run that battery bank completely flat, we could probably run the air conditioner for, I don't know, 14 hours or so out in the desert. But we don't do that and we never actually run the batteries to empty. But we do run the air conditioner overnight sometimes, which leaves us with quite a bit of recharging to do. But here's the thing. We've still got the stock 170 amp Balmar alternator. Now, driving down the road, we actually do see 150 amps or more when we're charging. So that 170 is actually a fair rating for the alternator, but just due to the size of our battery bank, it does take it a while to charge up. Now, we've adapted to that and adjusted our habits somewhat so that we only run the batteries down when we have driving days coming up, stuff like that. It would be nice to not have to think about it quite so much. But the bigger problem happens when we are not driving. Alternator output decreases as your engine RPMs slow down, and it decreases as the temperatures rise, and we live in the desert. So we were finding that at idle on a hot day, the second alternator was only putting out like 40 to 60 amps of charge. That's kind of a problem for us because our air conditioner consumes 100 amps in round numbers when it's running. So what that means is that even if we were to idle the engine, if we're running the air conditioner, we're still going to be running down the battery bank. So those are our two motivations for wanting to move to a larger alternator. Number one, faster charging on days when we're driving. And number two, charging at idle of more than 100 amps so that we can stay ahead of that air conditioner. Now, the new alternator from Nations has a theoretical maximum output of around 300 amps while driving, and it should put out more than 100 amps while we're at idle. So that's the easy one to understand, right? I mean, who doesn't want bigger, faster charging? But the second upgrade we're going to be doing requires a little more explanation. So we're also going to be upgrading our charge controller so that we can get better and I'll say smarter charging. Now the way the new charge controller will do this is by listening directly to the batteries over the network so that it can give them exactly the charge that they want. So let's go back to basics here too. Our alternator, both the new one and the old one, have external charge controllers. The Balmar alternator has a Balmar charge controller. And our new Nations alternator will have a wake speed charge controller. Now what these charge controllers do is they regulate the output of the alternator in order to give the batteries the charge profile that they're looking for. They're what's responsible for sending a bulk charge followed by an absorption charge period. And then when the batteries are all the way full, following that up with a float charge. And actually, all of the devices that charge your batteries perform this same kind of charge control. Your solar charge controller does it, your inverter charger does it, and the Balmar does it too. They all do this. But the way they do it is pretty simple. They have some inflection points which are based on voltage and time, 
and technically in the case of the Balmar, also on alternator field, but I'm not gonna dive in that deep. But the voltage and time-based control has worked for as long as we've had RVs with batteries. There's nothing really wrong with it, right? But we can do better. So to explain, imagine this scenario. We're parked at a campground with electric hookups overnight. That's great. During the overnight hours, our batteries get completely charged up and we go into float mode. Hooray, we're full, yay, okay? But then it's time to pack up camp and hit the road. We start the engine and basically the Balmar charge controller boots up and starts from scratch. It doesn't know any better, so it throws a 14.4 volt bulk charge at the battery bank. Now, I don't know what the default duration is for that bulk charge, but I do know I can't set it any shorter than six minutes. Now, if the batteries are full, the full bulk charge cycle will be a lot quicker than if it were really charging the batteries. But then, once the voltage has risen to 14.4 volts, it's going to enter into an absorption charge phase, which is also at 14.4 volts, and that's governed in part by time. Now, the minimum time you can set with the Balmar for absorption is also six minutes, but due to the size of our battery bank, in order to ensure that all of our batteries get fully charged, one hour is actually a more appropriate value for us. When I tried setting that absorption time to less than that, we frequently didn't get all of our batteries charged all the way up. So now getting back to our scenario, when we start driving with fully charged batteries, those batteries really only want a 13.6 volt float charge. But instead of 13.6 volts, I'm shoving them 14.4 volts for at least one hour and six minutes. And this cycle repeats every time we stop for gas, every time we stop to eat. Basically, any time that ball mark gets rebooted, we're sort of overcharging the batteries. It's, it's not the end of the world, but it's not great either. You see, the problem is that the ball mark just doesn't know from one startup to the next what state of charge the batteries are at. But you know what does know? The batteries. And they're actually shouting this information into the void, but nobody is listening. That information comes from the BMS on each of our Lithionics batteries. And you can actually see it if you have the Lithionics app. So here's a screen for one of our batteries, and this one is showing 83% full right now. But if you go to the detail page, you'll see this. And here's where you see that information. It's displayed in three fields. There's can charger voltage, where the BMS is saying what charge voltage it would like to see right now. There's CAN charger current, where the BMS is saying how much current it would be willing to accept. And then CAN charger status, which is FFO3, which means bulk charge, and O4 is absorption, and O5 is float. So, our Lithionics batteries are broadcasting this all the time. Every second they're turned on, they're telling us exactly how to best take care of them. They're broadcasting this information because our batteries are CAN capable. So they'll put this information onto a network. But again, like I said, nobody's listening. So that's what we're gonna fix with the new charge controller. We'll be replacing the Balmar with a wake speed charge controller that we're gonna to configure to listen to our, our Lithionics batteries, all five of them, and then give them exactly the charge that they're asking for. This way, when the batteries are full and we stop for gas, we don't overcharge them at all, no matter how many times we start and stop the engine, because the BMS knows what kind of charge it wants, and as long as the wake speed charge controller is listening, everything is going to be A-OK. -okay. So that is why CAN-based charging is really kind of just a smarter way to charge. Now, our Lithionics batteries already have this capability built in, so we've already got what we need there. I just need to configure each battery with a unique network ID so that they'll show up on the network individually. And that's actually pretty easy to do. Lithionics has posted some videos about how to do that. That one's not too hard. The other thing we need are some wiring adapters from Lithionics so that we can actually physically connect all five batteries and the wake speed charge controller into a little network so that they can communicate. And of course, we need the smarter charge controller, the wake speed, that can make sense of all the data and then control the new second alternator to deliver the charge that the batteries want. So that is what we're gonna be installing. So let's get back to the action. Okay, so we're here in the shop with Adam Nations. Now, Adam, you're the owner, operator, grand poobah, <laughs> emperor of Nations Every, Ultimate. All the, all the above, yes. Right on. And so these are, I believe, the things that are going into RV number one today. Yes. So I recognize the alternator. What can you tell us about that one? 
Um, well, this is Nations Transit 300 XMWS. The WS is for wake speed, so this is a mm. externally regulated alternator. Okay. Uh, here is the wake speed controller, uh, a harness that we're going to put in there, and then we're going to route the can wires back to your large battery bank. To the, so the, the, these are the can wires, right? Can high and low. Can high and low. And that needs to go to our battery. And the rest of the, the connections are largely similar to the Bulmar? There won't be? Largely similar, but a lot of them are eliminated. Um, for those that don't know, CAN stands for Central Area Network. Thank you. That makes a direct communication between the batteries and the charging system. So the CAN high and low wires do eliminate the need for battery temp sensor, uh, current sensing wires, several other wires that are all communicated now over the CAN. Okay. And uh, beyond that, you know, it just simplifies the system and it gives all the information from the batteries to the alternator and the charging system. Awesome. So speaking of charging, how much charge do we expect out of that bad boy? Um, this is rated a maximum of 300 amps, hence the 300XM name. Nice. Um, cruising speeds, in reality, you're probably going to get a continuous 230 amp going down the highway. Okay. Uh, at idle, this is going to do between 130 and 150, depending on temperatures. And uh, yeah, it'll just do a good job charging all those batteries. Getting, getting over 100 at idle is kind of key for us because that's sort of what our air conditioner takes. And yeah. so if we can get over 100 at idle and then still produce a little more power, then we're sitting pretty no matter where we are. So well, that's the idea. We give you what you need to run your RV, and then we give extra to the batteries to charge them up. So now, does this go in the same, like, the exact same place, same bracket as what's in there? Yeah, this, this is the egress. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, this is made to basically, once you remove the Balmar, which has an adapter bracket, this just bolts directly in the place where this alternator was. Oh. Yeah, one thing, too, to notice is the pulley. Uh, that has a clutching mechanism, it's called an OAD pulley, and uh, what that does with the electrical vibration that is that happens when the alternator magnetizes and it's putting out, it creates a ripple through the belt. Mm. So that helps to dampen that vibration and make the belt life longer. Awesome. So there's a lot of work to do and I don't want to get in your way, so I'm going to let you guys get to it. Alright. Thank you, James. second alternator is already in place. You guys work fast. And then the inside bits, I was kind of worried, but you didn't really have to do a whole lot inside. What, what all have we done here? Okay, so on the inside, and this was really easy, is we just removed the caps for the M12 connector. Mm -hmm. And uh, using the uh, adapters from Lithionics, we have just essentially daisy chained all the batteries together on the CAN network. So, you know, we have true RVC uh, use here, and uh, we have a terminator at the end, and then okay. there's another terminator at the at the wake speed. Okay. Correct. And now you did this without even having to run, so we didn't have to run really a new harness or, or a new pair of wires here because I found this was our battery temperature sensor, and you were able to repurpose those wires? Correct. So again, the battery temp sensor is Redundant. something that's communicated over the the network so we just use the wire that was already run in uh, clip the the sensor off and then splice that into the adapter into the uh, cables so mm -hmm. real easy 
So we didn't, th that was that was what I was worried was going to take the most time, was running new cables all around the rig, and you were able to reuse most of what was already there, it sounds like, so. Yeah, saved a lot of time for sure. Okay, so how do we know if it all works? Uh, well, that's the final step. We, we fire it up, and uh, then we're going to run a putty file, and that's going to give us a readout. We're going to log a session about three minutes long and just verify all the batteries are online individually and that there's communication. Awesome. That's next. Okay, now we've got the air conditioner running back there right now. That's, is that, that's okay, right? That's fine. That's fine. We should have plenty of power. All right, so start it up. Yep, start it up. All right. Ooh, I heard it bog down there. There it goes. All right. So now we have the putty file open and it is populating the numbers. This is the information that's coming from the regulator. And so we're, we're reading what's going on. Is that my ba current battery voltage? The roughly? column to the far left is the battery voltage. Okay. And this is measuring them as a whole. Uh, we can go in and measure them individually as well, but this is measuring the entire battery bank. And then 14.4, I recognize that's my bulk charge voltage. Absolutely. So the center column then tells us what the batteries want. They're okay. calling for 14.4. And then a total with your batteries of a thousand amps. <laughs> so <laughs> my batteries were a thousand amps. Pretty excessive. Good luck. So <laughs> can we see what uh, what wattage we're currently getting? Yeah, I think right now with the air conditioner running, it is just showing a net positive of around a hundred watts. So we have that big load that's running in the back. Let's see. Yeah, it's it's roughly it's bouncing in and out of one amp. Yeah. So it, we're so we're breaking even and uh, putting just a little bit more into the batteries right now, sitting here at idle. From everything we can see here, it seems to be working. It's summing up the voltage. In everything's the working. Everything's communicating. Um, on the wake speed, that blinking orange light indicates that we do have can lock between the uh, batteries and the wake speed. So that means that there's no interruptions or dropouts in the No interruptions, no faults, everything's working as it should be. Cool. All right, well, I guess uh, I'll shut it down and you guys can... All right, now we'll, uh, we'll get everything now. Everything just about wrapped up. We've got the wake speed mounted in more or less the same place that the uh, that the Balmar was. So there's not really much left to do except uh, head out on the road for a field test. But Adam, if other people see this and they think this is as cool as I do, what do they do? How do they get a hold of you? How do they go about doing something like this on their? This is the second vehicle, by the way, that we've had one of your alternators. And yep. We had one in Lance, and now we've got one in number one. How do people follow in our footsteps? Um, well, you can go to our website, nationstarteraltnator.com. Email uh, can go to sales at nationstarteraltnator.com. Also, our phone number is there, which is 888-334-2632. And we'd be more to help whether you have an Echo, you have a different RV that you want to replace the generator, add lithium, uh, upgrade your electronics, we'd be more than happy to help. Awesome. So, like I said, we're, we've been running the air conditioner now, sitting here like for like, gosh, about a half hour now. So we are going to take it out and see if we can throw some massive charge at our battery bank. So, all right, Adam, thanks a lot. And uh, you're very welcome. We'll see you later. All right. Happy Bye trails. Now. Okay, we're driving. We're on our way back to Utah from Nation's Alternator. And I've been doing a little, Steph's driving. I'm back here. I'm, built, I'm buckled in. I've been doing a little bit of testing and experimenting already on the way home. And so I've got some notes and I thought I'd just share them now. So remember, we have five 320 amp hour batteries right here under this bench seat. And 
So let's talk about the alternator first. So with our previous alternator, I'd find that we'd get about 30 amps per battery of charging while driving down the highway like this. With this alternator, I'm finding I'm getting, you can see here, 54, 53 amps for this first battery. And let's go to the last one maybe. We're getting 50 amps here. So we're getting 50 amps or more per battery. So old alternator, maybe 150 amps total driving down the highway. This one over 250 amps while we're driving down the highway. And that we were doing the same thing yesterday and the temperatures were over 90 and I was still getting that much output. So good performance from the alternator. Now you can see if you look into one of these batteries like this, you can actually see the number of watts. This is a 674 watts right now going into this battery. And I actually had Steph sum all those up once while I was driving and we came up with 2880 something watts and that is, I want to point out, more than you would get from the generator, which is an option on this Winnebago Echo. So this really is kind of an underhood generator, although I don't like to use that term. It's a second alternator. Anyway, um, now, as far as the charge controller goes, I have been keeping a close eye on that, and we are getting the CAN data from the batteries going to the wake speed charge controller. And every time I've looked, and we can look now, and so we can see we're obviously in a bulk charge state now, and I can see here that the batteries are calling for a 14.4 volt charge at up to 300 amps and the voltage will rise as we go through bulk charge. And let's just pick any battery and they're all gonna say the same thing. It's battery number three in the middle of the, middle of the kit. Come on. Also 14.4. So every time I looked at this yesterday and I was trying to catch it, every time I've looked, the batteries were getting exactly what they were asking for. It, I, and I caught all three states. I caught bulk, like what we're in now. I caught absorption charging, which doesn't last all that long. And then I even caught float. And I even tried to trick it. So I let the batteries get full. They were floating at 13.6, like they should. The alternator was putting out 13.6. And then I went back and turned on the air conditioner and inverter in the back, which was an instant load of over 100 amps going through the inverter. And when I did that, it stayed right at 13.6 volts. Everybody stayed in float. There was no voltage sag. I didn't drop anything back into a re-bulk charge, not even the solar charge controller. And that's just voltage based, by the way, my solar charge controller. It didn't, and it will go back into bulk if it detects a voltage drop of one tenth of a volt. And it didn't even see that, it stayed right at 30, and I thought that was cool. I thought I would catch it or trick it and make it go into bulk, but I didn't. Now, it turns out, they actually, Wake Speed has a name for that. They call it zero output technology, which basically enables the alternator to remain active without, and supply loads in your coach without dipping into the batteries at all. And that's exactly what I saw. So we're getting great performance out of the alternator and charge controller combo. Now at idle. We haven't done a whole lot of idling because we're trying to get back to Utah. But I did a little bit of idling and con we've consistently we're getting over 100 amps at idle. And that's the magic number because that's what it takes to run our air conditioner. And that was with solar turned off, by the way. We got 100 amps at idle or more than 100 with solar off so we could charge the batteries and run the air conditioner. That's awesome. Now this morning, when we, when we started off cold, we just quick ran through this kind of thing and like, you know, checked and added up all the, all the uh, amps on all the batteries. This one's getting 39 right now. Added up all the amps on all the batteries and we got over 212 at idle just starting out. Now that's a cold engine. It's gonna go down. Alternator performance decreases as you increase the temperature, but still kind of cool. 200 and something, 212 amps at idle. Previously, with our old alternator and charge controller on a hot engine, we would only get 40 to 60 amps. It wasn't enough to run the air conditioning, let alone run the air conditioning and charge the battery. Now, obviously more testing is called for on the idle thing because we live in the desert. When we get home, I can park it and let it run in the hot, hot, hotness and see what sort of performance we get in that kind of environment. So what does all this mean? 
Well, you know, the thing, the, the big thing, the, the alternator, the much larger alternator, is it's going to charge our batteries a lot faster. So for us, we have five batteries, that's 20,480 watt hours of capacity. From completely empty to completely full, that would take seven hours or a little less than that. But here's the thing, we never, ever let our batteries get completely empty. So this Echo also comes in a two battery configuration as a example. In the two battery configuration, this alternator and charge controller combo would take this vehicle from completely empty flat batteries, they've cut themselves off at 10%, to completely full in two and a half hours. Now, I mentioned it doesn't take us seven hours to charge and it most likely never will. That's because we don't run our giant battery bank all the way down to zero or 10% cutoff. We don't run it down that far. We don't use day to day any more electricity than you do. We'd like to run the air conditioner, sure, but that's the same amount of electricity that anyone would use. So let's say you have a two battery Echo and you were to completely drain those batteries all the way down to you know, 10% cutoff. That's, you're, you're now effectively at zero. For us, that, that same amount of energy would take our batteries from 100% down to 60%. And we'd be like, eh, eh, well, all right, maybe it's time to charge. That's the benefit of having the large battery bank is we're not going all the way to flat every time. Um, let's see, uh, what does this mean in terms of the charge controller? Well, it means we are never, literally never overcharging the batteries. And I just feel better knowing that I'm actually charging based on, you know, like data as to what the batteries want. So they're always seeing the charge profile they want. We've even done things like, like we stop for gas, obviously. And then I've been watching the app as we start up from, from gas. And, you know, with a voltage-based charge controller, it doesn't know any better. So when you turn off the vehicle at the gas station, even though your batteries might be full, and then you turn it back on again, it's going to start with its routine. It's going to go into bulk absorb flow. Now those, sh those cycles will be shortened based on performance, but it's still going to throw 14.4 volts at your batteries right away. In this case, we could stop right now and then start up again and we would still see, well, I mean, right now we're bulk charging, so we want the 13.4. But when I looked yesterday, when we were full, we were not getting a bulk charge when really the batteries called for float. So, so far, pretty impressive performance out of this. I'm going to keep playing with it for as long as I can make stuff drive. And then, uh, yeah, anyway, all good news so far. Okay. So to kind of wrap this thing up, there's just two final points I want to make here to address questions that I know I'm going to get because I had the questions too. The first one is what will the wake speed charge controller do when one battery is asking for float and another battery is asking for an absorption charge? And that's a very good question, but now I can answer that from experience. The wake speed is programmed to take the more conservative approach to charging, and it's going to regulate to the lowest required voltage. That way nobody is getting overcharged. And since I've wired my batteries up like in parallel with diagonal takeoffs and whatnot, those situations where they're asking for different charges are reasonably short when they do happen, and I actually have been watching that kind of thing. Now, the next question is, well, now that your alternator is charging based on CAN data, shouldn't your inverter charger and the solar charge controller also be looking at that same data? And the answer is, yes, they should. And I'm using Victron products for both of those, so they are capable of reading that CAN data. But that requires some gateways and more equipment, more money, yada, 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 yada. But the thing about those charging sources is they don't start and stop like 20 times a day like the engine can. Solar starts and stops exactly once per day and the inverter charger might not even be once per day. It's only when we plug in. So by addressing that problem at the alternator, I've by far made the biggest impact. But don't think I'm not thinking about those other charging sources and maybe I'll address them in a future video, maybe. Anyway, that's going to do it for this video. Uh, if you've got questions, you can click on over to the FitRV website. There will be a link in the YouTube description down below, and I will try to answer your questions. That's going to do it for now. This is James. See you later. Bye. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 you let me out? I hate that. I'd love to stuff up, so I'd rather place this and more.